These hints are on the course website, so you can access these. So let's briefly go through them. This is the front page of this year's midterm exam. Okay, uh, it's a three-hour exam. Uh, most things you should be aware of in terms of the structure and format of the exam. But some instructions. Okay, it's 18 pages long. It's a closed book exam. No dictionary. A calculator is allowed and encouraged. That is, bring a calculator. Just a normal standard calculator, not your mobile phone. Uh, so, even if you some questions, if you can calculate in your head, still use your calculator to be sure what the answer is and save yourself time. Okay, so use your calculator. These things are normal. Um, okay, these last three are specific to the exam. When I talk about a sequence of bits, I uh, talk about it in the order of left to right. That is, if I talk about the first bit of some sequence, it's the leftmost bit. The last bit is the rightmost bit. Okay? The way that you read it, left to right. Uh, some people uh, have asked questions about that before. So in the, this example sequence of eight bits, the first bit is zero, the last bit is bit one, is value one. Assume the speed of transmission is 3 by 10 to the 8 meters per second, unless I say otherwise, you can assume that throughout the exam. Uh, and then I give you four equations, which are the main ones that we've covered this, this semester so far. The free space propagation path loss model, so relating to all of these factors that indicate how much power do we lose across a link. Of course you need to know how to use this equation. If I give you a question with gain in dBi, you need to realize that you cannot simply insert the dBi value into this equation. These values of g are the absolute gains. So you need to convert that dBi value back to the uh, absolute value. Okay, so be careful and be aware of what values each of these variables are. They're not the dB values, they're not the decibel values. Lambda, of course you need to know how to determine lambda, the wavelength is the speed of light divided by the frequency of this signal. The equation for the gain of antenna, so depends upon the effective area and again in, in, rea in real systems the effective area is dependent upon the size of the antenna but we don't have an easy way to calculate the effective area of some antennas so I may have to give you information like okay assume the effective area is 10 square centimeters then determine the gain of that antenna and then the two capacity equations are given so Nyquist capacity and you need to understand what does M mean B and C and similar C, B and S and R, what do they mean? So I give you those equations, you need to know how to use them. There are no other equations provided that we've gone through, I think they are the main ones we've seen in this course. Uh, for example, how to determine decibels, dB, that's not provided, you need to know that. So this is for the front page of this year's, this is given on the front page of this year's midterm exam for those arriving late. And then some hints. So again, no need to copy these down. You can download this file on the website and, and read it yourself. There are nine questions, 100 marks in total. Question one is a fill in the, bank, fill in the blanks type question. We'll see an example of it from last year's exam. It's similar, different types, different <coughs> questions. Uh, you need to put in the, the the most correct word into some statement. And two to nine are some general questions with calculations and multiple parts. They're not just a single part. We cover everything up until and including signal encoding techniques. So last week we finished on PCM, pulse code modulation. That will be covered. Uh, some, some guidelines or some hints. All right, show your calculations. Uh, don't just write your final answer, so don't do the calculations on your, on your um, 
calculator or on another piece of paper and just write the final answer because if it's wrong, you'll get zero marks. But if you show your calculations and your final answer is wrong, but some steps are correct, you'll get some partial marks. Uh, if it's a long calculation and you do many different variations, that is, you, you write all over the page, make sure it's clear to a reader that where is your final answer, what is your correct answer. So in most cases, not a problem, but some people write in many different columns on the same page. So just make sure it's logical to, to follow and it's clear to me what your answer is. Some students give multiple answers to one question. Multiple different answers. In that case, unless all of them are correct, I'll mark you wrong. Okay? So some people, okay, what is this value in, uh, what is the value of the power? They'll give three different answers and uh, one may be correct. If the other two are wrong, then I mark the entire question wrong. Give just one answer to the question. Uh, all right, for practice, for preparation, then use the, the quizzes, the online quizzes, past exams. So today we'll go through last year's exam, at least some selected questions from that, to give you an indicator of the types of questions. Always include the units when appropriate, when needed. Okay. You'll lose marks if you don't include units. The prefixes uh, you can choose. Okay. Whether it's microwatts, milliwatts, megawatts, as long as the, the number is correct with the right prefix, that as long then I'll mark you correct. But the units, watts, must be included, or the appropriate unit. And understand what the units and prefixes mean. What's the difference between the lowercase m, milliwatts, lowercase b, uppercase b, bits, mm. bytes? Okay. I will not answer questions from you. What does mb mean in the exam? No penalty for wrong answers, so attempt all questions. Okay. So, uh, especially the fill in the blanks. Don't leave one of them blank. If you have no idea, then guess one. Okay. You've got a small chance, or try and give, give an intelligent guess, but cut it down and, and you, you may be successful. So that are the hints from, for this year's midterm exam. Again, on the website you can uh, download and read through that in your own time. Any questions about the midterm? Uh, so everything's covered, everything that we've gone through in lectures at least. Everyone's prepared? Well, you have two weeks, so you have a bit of time to prepare for the midterm. So what we'll do if there are no questions about this is go back to last year's midterm, just scroll through and, and do some of the questions as we, go, as we, we uh, discuss them. And you have last year's midterm in your handouts, I hope. Go to, the, go to the end of your handouts and see if you have the, the last pages. You have last year's midterm at the end of your handouts. So that's what we'll go through now. So you have it on your handouts. I'll show it on the screen. Not much to see at the start. I will not go through all the questions because we will not have time, I don't think, but uh, we'll go through some of them, or I'll ask you to answer some of them. The first one, and similar for this year, is this fill in the blanks type question. I give you a set of possible answers, a set of terms or words and then a set of questions or statements and you need to select the most appropriate uh, answer and fill it in here, write it in here. Okay? So the application layer protocol used by web browsers to download web pages is... What's the answer? HTTP. 
Okay? We, we've mentioned that for web browsing several times in earlier lectures. So what you'd need to do is the answer must come from this set. Other, other answers will not be marked. Okay? So it must come from this set. Um, so simply you'd write HTTP here. You don't have to expand it. Just HTTP, write it here. Uh, so we'll not go through all of these now. Uh, that's some easy ones you can practice. Again, wrong answers, no penalty. So attempt everyone. Um, you may use these terms more than once. So there may be two or more questions which have the answer of HTTP. Just because we use HTTP here doesn't mean it's not a correct answer in another one. And there may be, although there may be multiple correct answers, only give one answer. Okay? Even if there are two, two answers in here that are correct, just give one and that will be marked correct. Okay? Just give one of the answers one answer in each question. If Again, if you give two and one of them is correct and one's incorrect, then I'll mark you wrong. Okay? So just give one answer for each question. Any questions about these types of fill-in-the-blank questions? I can't remember how many we have this, this year, but maybe 10 to 20 questions here. There were 15 or so questions. They don't take long, but think carefully about them okay, when you answer. Some are not obvious, some are. Generally about concepts that we've uh, covered in the, in the courses. Let's now just go through, in this exam, I'm not sure the total the number of questions, but we'll go through some of those questions. Uh, to give you a chance to, to recall what we've covered in previous, earlier parts of the semester. Try this question. An encoding scheme maps 10 bits of digital data into one signal element. Part A, in a noise-free environment with a bandwidth of 20 megahertz, what's the maximum theoretical data rate possible? You should be able to calculate that in, in a couple of minutes. Okay. So try and do it for the next few minutes and at least try and connect, well, what, what topic are we talking about? What information do I need to use from this question? And then how do I calculate the answer? So in your handouts, you have this exam uh, right at the end of the handouts. It's also on the website if you need. Where do you get started on this? First main question of the exam, can you solve it? As, as a guide, maybe try and, from the question, identify the important information, the numbers, uh, and then try and work out, well, what, what's the question asking for? Gives us something about 10 bits of digital data, one signal element. 
bandwidth, 20 megahertz. It's asking for data rate. And there's some other information there. So you need to try and work out, okay, now I need to determine the data rate maximum data rate possible. I know the bandwidth, I know something about the data and the signal elements. What do we use to determine the data rate? And the maximum possible data rate. I see some people have the right equation. Another term we use to talk about the maximum theoretical data rate is the capacity. If we have some link, and we want to send bits across it, how many bits per second, well, that's the data rate. What's the maximum we can achieve? Well, that's the capacity of that link. That's the number of levels. That's the, if you can solve that, you can solve the, uh, uh, solve the question. No. So first you need to connect, okay, it's asking for something about capacity and it's saying in a noise-free environment, well, we know two equations that relate bandwidth to capacity. Nyquist capacity, Shannon capacity, they're at the front of the exam. What's the difference between them? Well, Nyquist capacity assumes you're operating in a noise-free environment, there's no noise. So this suggests that to solve this, we need to use the Nyquist capacity equation. Which is given at the start of the exam. The capacity C, or the maximum possible data rate, equals two times the bandwidth log base 2 of m. Okay, you know the bandwidth. B is given in the question, 20 megahertz. So you know B. You're trying to find C. Then the last part is, well, what is m? So now you need to know, well, in this equation, although I give it to you, what does m mean? And how does that relate to our question? We know B. 20 megahertz. We want to find C, but we need to know M. What's the definition of M? What's the definition of M? What, what, how do you describe M? Levels, the number of levels. Yes, so... Uh, M in our equation, sorry, not here, M is the number of levels. So uh, think of all right, our sine wave, we can have uh, a high and a low, two levels, but in fact more complex signals we can break into, okay, a high amplitude, a medium amplitude, uh, or high, uh, medium, a negative, and then a, a uh, a large negative amplitude. That is, we can break it into four different heights or eight different heights. So the number of levels of our signal because all of our our digital data maps to one of those levels. So yes, M is the number of levels. Well, how do we determine M? Ten bits of digital data into one signal element. When we have, say, two levels, high and low, the very basic scheme, we map one bit to each level. Let's say, like that. That is, two levels, m equals two, one bit per level or per signal element. So the question says, okay, now we have 10 bits in one signal element. So we have some level, 
which corresponds to 10 bits. And then we have another level that corresponds to another 10 bits. And we have more levels, each corresponding to a different sequence of 10 bits. So 10 bits per level, 10 bits per signal element. So how many levels are there? Well, 10 to the power of, uh, two, 2 to the power of 10 in that case, 1024. Because if you list them all out, then you'll get up to level 1024. With 10 bits, 10 bit numbers, the number of possible values we have is 2 to the power of 10, or 1024. So in this case, each level corresponds to 10 bits. That is, 10 bits of digital data maps into one level, or the term here is one signal element. Whatever that level is, it doesn't have to be high or low, it has some amplitude, some phase, some uh, frequency. So now we know m, 2 to the power of 10. And now you simply solve for, uh, solve for c. Uh, what do we get to? We have our bandwidth. We know M is 2 to the power of 10 or 1024 because there are 10 bits per signal element, which means one signal element represents, uh, is represent, represents 10 bits, so we need 1024 different signal elements to represent any of those combination of bits. And then we just use the Nyquist capacity equation. C equals 2 times the bandwidth log base 2 of M. Log base 2 of 1024 is, you don't need your calculator there, log base 2 of 2 to the power of 10 is of course 10. So we get 10 times 2 times b, which 400, 2 times 20 is 40 times 10, 400. Here, bandwidth is in megahertz. Capacity will be in megabits per second. So same prefix. but the units are not hertz, but bits per second. So our answer, 400 megabits per second. Any questions? So we'll go through some in more detail, some we'll skip over or go quickly. Uh, any questions about this first one? Easy. The mathematics is easy. The hard part is connecting the question to the, the right equation, to the right concept. <clears throat> Again, bring your calculator to the exam so you have uh, no reason to make simple mistakes in calculations and you can be fast, you don't have to use your head to calculate. All of the answers for this exam you can find online, so there's also an answer sheet online. Uh, there's no need to copy down or what I have here, uh, so you'll find the answers online. Okay, so here's a 
a variation. If the level of noise was measured at 26.877 dBm, received signal strength 33 dBw, with a channel of bandwidth 30 megahertz, what's again the maximum theoretical data rate? What's the capacity of our channel, of our link? And here, well, you need to connect the question which gives us asking for capacity, gives us bandwidth, then it gives us something about noise and received signal strength. Remember Nyquist equation assumes no noise. Shannon capacity takes into account the signal to noise ratio. So here you need to use Shannon capacity equation. So look at the equation and then determine the, the parameters in that equation. So quickly try and solve that one and then we'll move on. And of course Shannon capacity equation is given at the front. Our maximum data rate or our capacity C is what we want to solve. We have the bandwidth B, it's given. E B times log base 2 of 1 plus SNR. You need to now know what SNR is. Signal to noise ratio. So it's signal received divided by noise. It's a ratio of the signal received to the, the noise received. So I've noted the bandwidth that was given. I said the, the question says the signal received. So I don't note that as S, 33 dBW and N, the noise received, N, 26.877 dBm. And Shannon capacity equation, B log base 2 of 1 plus SNR. Almost there, except you need to realize that, well, what is SNR? Signal to noise ratio is easy. It's signal divided by noise. So we need to know the signal and the noise value. But the problem is that in the question, or in the Shannon capacity equation, the values of the signal and noise are in the absolute values, not in their dB values. So even though SNR is simply S divided by N, signal divided by noise, we need to make sure the values of S and N are in the, using the right scale, not using dB. So in fact, we need to convert S, in this case, let's say, to watts, and convert N into the same units, with the same prefix.
and then we can plug them into the equation. So, how many watts is the received signal? What is S? 33 dBW. Again, or now you need to know the, the dB equation. 10, the dB value is 10 log in base 10 of some power level. Uh, Let's write it here. 33 dBW equals 10 log base 10 of some power level, P, I'll say. What is P? What is the original power level? So you just need to solve for P there, or, uh, which is in fact what I'll write here as the answer. 33 divided by 10 is 3.3. And to solve for the, the original power level, it's 10 to the power of 3.3. That's a 3 watts. So convert our decibel value into the original absolute value. Using this uh, equation, so divide by 10, we get 3.3. Log base 10 of something equals 3.3. That something equals 10 to the power of 3.3 watts. dB watts, the resulting value is in watts. And do the same for the noise in this case. Using the same approach, you'll find the noise of 26.877 dBm is 10 to the power of 2.6877. What's the unit? Milliwatts. dBm, the M stands for milliwatts, not meters decibels uh, relative to a milliwatt. So the units here is milliwatts. How many watts? Now, if we're going to calculate signal-to-noise ratio, S divided by N, they need to have the same prefix. So we have 10 to the power of 3.3 watts, whatever that value is, and 10 to the power of 2.6877 milliwatts. You can use your calculator to solve. And then convert the, the value of, from milliwatts into watts. Uh, let's have a calculator. Ten to the power of for example two point six eight seven seven is 487 milliwatts. So then how many watts? We'll divide by 1,000 there. So the noise level in watts, 0.487198834. And And then we can solve SNR, which is signal divided by noise. We 
different as they are. Let's do it again. Point four eight seven is our noise value and our signal is 10 to the power of 3.3. So 10 to the power of 3.3, the signal divided by the noise, about 4,095. So we know the bandwidth in the equation was 30 megahertz. We have now the signal to noise ratio. S divided by N, 4,095, plus 1, 4,096. Log of 4,096 in base 2, you'll use your calculator or you'll remember, uh, is 12. Is 12. So log of 4096 is 12, so it becomes 12 times the bandwidth. Uh, 12 times 30 megahertz gives us 360 megabits per second. Should be your final answer in this case. Again, use your calculator to solve these problems. Again, the difficult part is using the equation and using it correctly by making sure that the values that you plug into the equation are in the correct scale, the correct units. Convert from decibels to the absolute value, for example. Let's move on. We've gone through that one in detail. There's a third part you'll try and solve. Let's have a look at some of the other questions. We'll come back to this one because it takes a while to calculate. It's a question about, okay, without reading, there's something about the protocol stack. Draw a protocol stack labeling each layer for one of the computers. So th go back to some of our earlier lectures that talked about the five layer protocol stack application, transport, network, data link, physical layer. And related to that question, you can draw a picture of that stack. A protocol stack is a protocol architecture that the, a picture with those five layers, for example. Uh, if we have time at the end, we'll come back to the calculation of overhead in this one. Uh, let's go through some others. So questions about overhead, bits transmitted and throughput. Question four is about if you read through the details about free space path loss, how much power do we lose in a particular scenario? We have a wireless LAN access point. The workers in the company have some tablets with wireless LAN capabilities. They connect to the access point, so we have some access point and we have the users with their tablets connecting. Some characteristics of both the access point and tablets, transmit power, Receive power threshold, frequency, and antenna gain of 6 dBi. You do some experiments and measure the maximum distance between access point and tablet that they work, that they communicate, is 169 meters. Alright, the first one, what is the transmit power of the access point measured in dBm? All right, we did a conversion in the opposite direction in the previous question of converting dB or dBm to absolute value. This part A requires you to convert 0.1 watts into dBm.
easy one to do. What is the wavelength of the transmitted signal? How do you calculate the wavelength? Wavelength. What's the equation for wavelength? Lambda equals... You need to remember it's not given in anything. Lambda equals... Speed of light divided by the frequency. Okay, so that's all you need here. What is the wavelength? Lambda equals the C, the speed of light, which is given on the front page, 3 by 10 to the 8 meters per second, divided by the frequency, 2.4 by 10 to the power of 9 hertz. Okay, calculate the wavelength. What is the gain of the tablet antenna? This is the hard part. If we look at the question, and if you look at the free space path loss model, we'll see that there's a transmit power, PT. There's a receive power, the power that we can receive the signal, PR. Frequency, and therefore wavelength, lambda, we know. We know something about the antenna gain, 6 dBi. We know the, or the antenna of the access point. We know the distance, 169 meters. If we assume free space path loss, what is the gain of the tablet antenna? So let's write down the, our equation for free space path loss. Again, it's the front of the exam. This equation is given. So if we look at the question, we know PT, transmit power. We know PR, receive power. We know lambda, the wavelength. We calculated that. The question gives us the distance between the two devices at 169 metres, so we know D. 4 pi D, all squared. One of the antennas is the antenna of the access point. The other is the antenna of the tablet. Let's say GT for the access point, the transmitting device, was given as 6 dBi, so we can determine GT. The question asks us, what's the gain of the tablet? Say GR. So we have an equation. We know all variables except one, GR. Then it's just a matter of rearranging to solve for GR. Let's list the values. I will not solve or go through the detailed steps, but we can list the values. Transmit power, PT, from the question was 0.1 watts, or say you know, 0.1 watts. PR was given to be 277 by 10 to the minus 6 milliwatts. We need to make sure both of those, those powers in, use the same prefix, watts. Both use watts or both use milliwatts. The, D, the distance D was 169 metres. Lambda we should have calculated in the previous part, uh, but you'll check and find it's 0 0.125 metres. And the gain of one of our transmitters, say gain of the transmit antenna was 6 dBi. And remember, in our free space path loss equation, the gain is not in decibels, but in the absolute value. So convert that. In that case, it becomes 10 to the power of 0 
convert the, the dB value into the absolute value. Remember our general equation, 10 log base 10 of some power level equals the dB value. So going backwards, 6 divided by 10.6 and 10 to the power of 0.6 is our absolute value. So if you now look at your equation for free space path loss, you have these five variables. The ones missing is G GR, the gain of the antenna at the tablet. So you just solve for GR. Plug those values, actually maybe convert our transmit power to milliwatts. So everything's in the same prefix. 0.1 watt is 100 milliwatts. Since the two powers are now using the same prefix, both milliwatts, we can plug them into the equation. So we have 100 milliwatts, 2.77, 10 to the minus 6 milliwatts, 169 meters, 0 0.125 meters, gain 10, 10 to the power of 0 0.6. Take those values, put them into this equation. And there'll be something missing, GR. And you'll rearrange, and that's what you'll get, GR. Again, the mathematics is easy. It's how to use the equation in the right way. That's the difficult part. And you'll find GR is about 2. is the absolute value, which is if you solve the equation, which is about 3 dBi. see what other questions we have. If you don't catch the answers I draw here again they're on, on you can find the answer sheet on the website. Let's look at some other questions. There's another part to that one you'll have a look. So we can get through it one part of each question. Here's a quick one. Here's a signal. Draw a plot of that signal in the frequency domain. Try that. So you need to remember the basic form of our signal equation and note that this signal has four components. Determine the frequency of each of the components, the peak amplitude of those components and then plot that in the, in the frequency domain. So determine the, the frequency of each of those four components.
what's the frequency of the first component? First component? 20,000? 20, 20,000 hertz? For this, you just, and again, it wasn't given at the front of the exam, but you'll need to remember the general equation for our signal or a sinusoid. You need to remember that. Okay? If you know that, then you know that, okay, these four components, we can determine the value of f, the frequency of each component. The 2 pi ft, we have 40,000 pi t, therefore f, the frequency of that component, must be 20,000. 20,000 times 2 is 40,000 times pi times t. So the frequency of the first component is 20,000 hertz, 20 kilohertz. Same approach, the second component will be 60,000 100,000 and 140,000 hertz. So you determine the frequencies of those four components, the value of F in this equation. Also the peak amplitudes, the value of A, 10.5, 3.5, 2.1, 1.5, that's easy. And then the plot in the frequency domain shows impulses or spikes at those four frequencies with a height this, our, of the peak amplitude. What does that look like? I have a plot here. The four components in, in kilohertz here, 20 kilohertz, 60 kilohertz, 100 kilohertz, 140 kilohertz, and the height, 10.5, 3.5, 2.1, 1.5. So we have our signal plotted in the frequency domain. The part B question says, what's the absolute bandwidth? And you can determine that quickly by looking at the plot. The absolute bandwidth, remember the difference between the maximum and the minimum frequencies. The width between 20 and 140. So simply 120 kilohertz is the absolute bandwidth. So what is the value of the absolute bandwidth? 120,000 hertz. The width between, visually, between these two points. Part C, what is the value of the frequency of S1 of T? That is our, our signal. Well, we need to note that in this case that all of the components are frequencies which are multiple, integer multiples of 20 kilohertz. 20 kilohertz, 3 times 20 kilohertz, 5 times 20 kilohertz, 7 times 20 kilohertz. All of the components are multiples of 20 kilohertz, and hence the resulting frequency of the, N, of the addition of those components is simply 20 kilohertz. So when all of the components are integer multiple, or the component frequencies are integer multiples of one of the others, then that other one is the signal frequency, also called the fundamental frequency. So we have a fundamental frequency of 20 kilohertz, and the other three components are harmonics.
So the answer of part C is 20 kilohertz. There's a few more parts to that one, again, worth you reading through. So let's skip to a different question to see, uh, get a wide coverage of the topics. Let's go to a question which is not in the last year's exam, but is in, I think, a quiz, one of that practice quizzes. So you don't have this in, in front of you. You're making a voice call on your computer using some software like Skype. The software uses a PCM encoder and has 64 code numbers or 64 levels. If you remember PCM, we take some analog input and sample it and map it to one of the many levels. In this case, there are 64 possible levels. The software takes that analog input and produces digital data and sends that across the internet. And it sends that at a rate of 80 kilobits per second, or generates at a rate of 80 kilobits per second. What's the sampling period? Try and solve that one. Remember with PCM we're mapping analog data to digital output. What we do is we take the analog input, say this blue signal here, and we take samples at, at some regular interval. We take samples of the analog input and each of those sampled values, so the, the magnitude here maps to some level, so we divide this space into a set of level, levels. So this sample maps to this third level, this sample to this sixth level and so on. So in this question, your voice is the analog input and your your software on your computer is using PCM to sample your voice, so your microphone records your voice, the software samples it at some interval, and the number of levels used is 64 in this case. So there are 64 levels on the, on the vertical axis there. We take samples, we produce a number of bits in each sample, and then those bits are sent. In this case, the rate at which the bits are sent is 80,000 bits per second. Determine the sampling period. How many bits per sample in this case? Six bits per sample. Why six? Why six? Why two to the power of six? Sixty-four. Sixty-four levels. Our question says, you're right, uh, our sixty-four code numbers or sixty-four levels means each level over our diagram we take a sample at this point, maps to say this level three, we've got sixty-four different levels how many bits do we need to represent values 0 to 63? That is 64 different values. 6 bits, because 2 to the power of 6 is 64. That means if the decimal value was 3, then we need to use a 6-bit value. 
this is binary three, six bits long. Because it goes up to the maximum of 63, and to represent the value, decimal value 63, if we started at zero, 64 levels, zero to 63, we need six bits to represent 63s, six ones in that case. So every sample produces six bits of data. And we're producing data at a rate of 80,000 bits per second. So how many samples per second in that case? Try and determine the, the sampling frequency, the samples per second. We have 64 levels, therefore we determine 6 bits. 6 bits are needed to represent any of those levels, so 6 bits are created per sample. But the question says we're generating 80,000 bits per second. So now, well, how many samples per second? Six bits per sample, 80,000 bits per second. Samples per second, 80,000 divided by six, which is We have 80,000 bits if we want to work the samples per second. You're, you're correct for the final answer. Let's take the long approach. We'll see why in a moment. We have 13,333 samples per second. Each sample consists of six bits, giving us our 80,000 bits per second. Then the question was, how many, what's the period, the sampling period, the time between samples? So samples per second, we take the inverse and we get the, the number of seconds. So the inverse of 13,333 gives us, you're right, 700 and... Seventy five microseconds, I think. If there's 13,333 samples per second, there are one sample every 75 microseconds. So that's our answer in the end. 75 microseconds is the sampling period, the time between each sample, which is in our diagram this duration. 75 microseconds, 75 microseconds. So every 75 microseconds we generate six bits.
let's extend this question, not in the quiz. So we'd say our sampling frequency in this case is 13,333 samples per second. Let's say that our voice contained frequencies from 0 up to 4, well, let's say 3 kilohertz. So our application, our software on our computer was taking the analog input of the voice and producing bits as an output. Let's say that voice contained frequencies from 0 to 3 kilohertz. From 0 to 3 kilohertz is the original analog data. What's the ideal sampling frequency at this case? So if we know something about the analog input, it has a bandwidth of 3 kilohertz, the maximum frequency component is 3 kilohertz, then what's the ideal sampling frequency? In this question, the, the sampling frequency was 13,333 samples per second, or 13,333 hertz. But what's the ideal sampling frequency if this was the input? And this was the last thing that we covered, really, in the, the previous lecture. And maybe we didn't cover it in enough detail. Anyone want, want to attempt? What's the answer? Well, in the... I don't have them easy, but in the... When we looked at PCM, at the end there was something called the sampling theorem. It's actually the Nyquist-Shannon sampling theorem. A theorem that says that if our input data has a maximum frequency component of 3 kilohertz, then the ideal sampling rate, a sufficient sampling rate, is double that, 6 kilohertz. And the, the description, it was more general than that, but in practice, if we have an input with a range of frequency components and the maximum is B, say, then the ideal sampling frequency is two times that. So in this case, the ideal frequency would be 6 kilohertz. Ideal in that, we don't need to go larger than that. Less than would give us poor quality. Greater than 6 kilohertz would not increase the quality. Okay, so go back to your slides on the sampling theorem and that's a useful equation. Two times the maximum frequency component is the ideal sampling rate, sampling frequency. If it wasn't voice that I was sending but music and the music ranged from 10 hertz up to 15 kilohertz, the maximum frequency component is 15 kilohertz Therefore, the, the ideal sampling frequency is 30 kilohertz, two times the maximum. The ideal sampling frequency or rate. Sorry. In this case, would be two times the maximum, which would be six kilohertz. Two times three kilohertz. It's not two times the bandwidth. It's two times the maximum frequency component. Let's go back to our exam. Last five minutes at least see some of the questions that are remaining. Question about signals, which ones are better? So of the following plots there are some questions of uh, is A better than B or in what characteristics is A better than B? Okay, so think about 
signal accuracy and the bandwidth consumed and the data rate. Again, the one that's closer, and it turns out in this question, the one which is closer to the square wave is more accurate and less chance of errors. But we'll see it consumes more bandwidth if everything else is the same. So there's a trade-off. So there's some questions about the signals. What is an advantage of one compared to another and, uh, and different signals compared? Here's a question with a network with three devices and two links. A via link 1 to B, B via link 2 to C. First two parts ask for the transmission delay and the propagation delay. So again, there's no equations given. You need to remember transmission delay is the data size divided by the data rate. Propagation delay is the distance in meters divided by the speed say 3 by 10 to the 8 meters per second. So transmission delay for A to B, data size 125 bytes. From A to B, link 1, rate of 10 megabits per second. So it will be 125 bytes divided by 10 megabits per second. So make sure you convert bytes to bits in that case. Then what is the propagation delay? From B to C, distance is 30 kilometers. Our speed of light is assumed 3 by 10 to the 8 meters per second, so we can calculate the propagation delay. 30,000 meters divided by 3 by 10 to the 8 meters per second. They are the easy parts. The hardest part, in fact it's not much harder, but now consider the entire network, the two links. We send data from A through to C via B and then from C back to A. So the data across both of those links. And this requires you to determine the total delay. And it is quite easy because all you do is you determine the the delays of each component and then add the, all of them up. So you determine the transmission and propagation delays, queuing delays, processing delays, calculate them all in both directions, add them up and you get the final answer. Remember delay is additive, which means if we have multiple components we add them up to get the total delay. almost out of time, so let's uh, just show you the last questions. Question 7, what's the data? This one says we're using non-return to zero I, invert on ones. What's the first bit in this case? Remember, NRZI, invert on ones, whenever we have a bit one, we invert the signal, we change the, the level. So, in the first case, we change the level from low to high, therefore it must be bit one. Then we maintain the level, so it must be zero, it's not a one. So one, zero, then we change, one, we change, one, 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 zero, zero. So to determine the data in that case. In, in this year's exam, and it was the same as last year, you need to remember NRZI and NRZL, the two non-return to zero techniques. I will not describe what they are. But the other techniques, I will give a description if I ask a question about it. So like this, Manchester encoding is described as zero, transition high to low in the middle, one, transition from low to high in the middle. That's the definition of Manchester encoding. Given that, for this data, draw the signal. 
So I don't ask you to remember Manchester encoding, uh, just how to apply it if the description is given. And same for the other encoding techniques, uh, the other digital data to digital signal techniques. And there's another part, but that gets us to the end of last year's exam. We've covered some of the questions. You will go and do the others over the next two weeks in practice for uh, your midterm exam.